Nick Harvey of University of Waterloo, also soon to be of University of British Columbia, and he'll tell us about sports suppliers. Sports suppliers. Oh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, and I should especially thank you all for coming to the talk uh, just two days before the Fox deadline. Uh, you know, you must be very dedicated if you're actually here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that I find uh, very interesting and exciting at the moment, which is uh, graph sparsification. And it's joint work with uh, my student, uh, Isaac Fung. So uh, let me start off by uh, saying what sparsifiers are, if you haven't heard of them before. So uh, the, the general definition is, is uh, they're just a, a weighted subgraph of a graph that approximately preserve some useful properties of the graph. Uh, so the basic... Uh, So let's start off with uh, a simple example. So uh, and in fact, this will be the, the notion that we use throughout the talk, which is uh, approximating all the cuts of a graph. Uh, so a uh, well-known theorem of Binkser and Karger from 96 is that uh, there exists uh, sparsifiers with uh, roughly n log n edges uh, that preserve every cut in the graph to within a factor of 1 plus epsilon. Here n is the number of vertices in the graph. And a uh, stronger notion of approximation was uh, first studied by uh, Spielman and Teng uh, in their work on linear system solvers. Uh, and they defined this notion of spectral approximation, uh, which roughly means that the not only are, are cuts preserved, but the entire spectrum uh, of the graph is preserved to within a small multiplicative factor. And still, they, they require only about n log n edges. So uh, formally, uh, what does this mean? So uh, this, uh, this condition means that for every vector x, uh, we have these inequalities uh, between the Laplacian matrix of the original graph and the Laplacian matrix of the sparsifier. Uh, and if you, if you don't know what a Laplacian matrix is, that's fine. We're not going to use this at all in the rest of the talk. Uh, but uh, perhaps what's worth saying is that uh, this condition, the condition on approximating cuts, uh, follows from this just by uh, using 0, 1 vectors x. So these things typically apply to graphs only or to any uh, matrix? Uh, what so do you mean by these that things? Kind of approximation, meaning get, given a matrix LG, you found this LF. So can you do yes. it for any graph LG? Uh, for any matrix LG? For any, any graph LG, yes. Uh, for any matrix, um, not as far as I know. So in, for, for general matrices, there are these <coughs> other, other notions of uh, approximation, like uh, low rank approximation and things like that. But uh, the uh, condition they get <coughs> is not as strong as this, I believe. OK. So, uh, so not only do, do these sparsifiers exist, but uh, in both of these papers, uh, they, they give uh, nearly linear time algorithms to construct them. And I, sh I should mention here that uh, the, the bound on n log n edges, which I stated here, is not due to Spielman and Teng. It's due to Spielman and uh, Srivastava uh, in a, a follow-up work. So are, are these the sparsifiers uh, graphs or weighted graphs? Weighted graphs. Weighted graphs. Uh, so we can think of the, the initial, the input graph as being either weighted or unweighted. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but then the output graph, because it's uh, uh, reducing the, the number of edges so drastically, it needs to increase the weights of the edges to, to compensate for that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in a, uh, another uh, piece of work by uh, Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava, uh, they actually showed that the log n factor here is not necessary. In fact, there exist uh, sparsifiers with only uh, order n over epsilon squared edges uh, that approximate every cut and in fact they approximate uh, spectrally as well. And they gave polynomial time algorithms to construct these sparsifiers. So the, uh, uh, the importance of uh, sparsifiers comes from their, their use in designing fast algorithms. So essentially ever since the, the work of Benkser and Karger, uh, whenever one wants to solve a uh, a cut or sometimes flow problem, 
uh, and you're happy with approximations, then the first step of your algorithm just sh should be just to sparsify the graph. Because then you can just assume that your algorithm is running on a graph with only n log n edges. Can I ask a quick question about the yeah. previous slide? Is it possible okay. to achieve n plus 1 over epsilon squared? Uh, no. So uh, I believe n over epsilon squared is not the same. Uh, I believe so. Uh, yeah, but if the graph is a peak, then, yeah, uh, then an ex an ex the graph is uh, second eigen value epsilon. Yeah. So you need a degree to be 1 over epsilon squared. So, uh, all right. so, so this is just a, a laundry list of results uh, on uh, approximating uh, various cuts, and, and all of them use the, the Banks or Carger result as an initial step. So you don't have a Banks or Carger So you can do n plus n to the quarter of epsilon. Uh, yes. Faster max flow algorithm. Yes, yes, that is correct. Uh, well, this is this is better for some range of parameters. Okay, so the motivation for our work uh, was uh, was really that this uh, this algorithm of Batson, Spielman, and Servastova is is really quite mysterious, and it, it seems uh, too good to be true. So uh, I wanted to understand: is there are there some other methods to get sparsifiers? Uh, with only a linear number of edges. So one uh, wild speculation that I had is uh, perhaps if we took the union of a constant number of random spanning trees, then this might give a sparsifier. And I'll, I'll give some justification for that wild speculation later. Uh, one, uh, one simple justification is that, uh, well, it's true for the complete graph. So this was shown in work of Goyal, Rademacher, and Vampala, that you get an expander by picking uh, two spanning trees, uh, random spanning trees of the complete graph. But uh, actually what, so we're able to show that this wild speculation is actually false, uh, but we can, if we weaken it, uh, then we can show that uh, order log squared n uh, random spanning trees do give a sparsifier. So that's a corollary of our main result. So now let me state the sparsification problem more formally. So the, uh, the goal is uh, we want to design an algorithm that's given an undirected graph G, uh, here with no weights, but weights are okay too. And we want to output a weighted subgraph on the same vertex set, V, uh, and its edges, uh, F, are a subset of the edges of the initial graph. And we have this weight function on the edges, W. And the goal is that uh, the for every cut u, the size of the cut in the initial graph g differs from the weight of the cut in the sparsified graph h by just an epsilon fraction of the true value. Ah, okay, that's a good question. Uh, a priori, uh, there's no reason why, it, it seems uh, no reason why you would want to make that restriction, uh, but it turns out we can achieve that anyways, so. Uh, might as well add the restriction. Uh, at, but actually, for the case of spectral sparsifiers, I believe that is an important restriction. But for cut sparsifiers, there's no reason for it to be particularly important. OK. Uh, so that's our, our main goal, is to preserve all the cuts. And uh, also, we want the graph to be sparse, so the number of edges should be small, say, about n log n. And the running time of our algorithm should I ideally be fast, roughly, say, linear in the, in the size of the graph. So uh, why should one even have any hope that this is possible? So let's start with the, the simplest example of uh, sparsifying the, the complete graph. Uh, so uh, a simple exercise in, in random graphs is to, uh, is to show that if you, if you sparsify the complete graph by simply picking each edge with probability uh, p, say uh, log n over n. And uh, in, in h, we give each, uh, each sampled edge weight 1 over p. Then uh, our number of edges is, of course, 
an expectation about uh, well, n, uh, n log n, and, and the cuts are preserved uh, to within some uh, small multiplicative factor. So, uh, so this process gives us a, a sparsifier of the complete graph. So uh, at, the, at the risk of uh, getting into uh, gory details too early, uh, let me go through the, the proof of this, uh, this fact. Not because it's uh, particularly insightful, I'm sure you could, uh, uh, you've all seen it before or could all do it very easily, but it, it illustrates uh, three points that I want to bring up again uh, on a later slide. So, so the, the standard proof of this would be uh, essentially just to do a union bound over all cuts. So if we uh, consider any cut induced by k vertices, uh, then the, the size of the cut will be at least k times n over 2, assuming k is less than n over 2. Then we just look at the, uh, we define an indicator variable for each edge, saying whether it's sampled, and uh, we sum uh, these indicator variables over a cut, and uh, uh, that sum is the, the size of the cut in the sparsified graph. Uh, the expected value of x is just uh, p times the, the size of the cut in the original graph, which in this case is about 50 k log n, at least, at least 50 k log n. And we'll say that a cut fails if its uh, error, if its deviation from its expected value is uh, say half the at least half the expected value. So now a simple turnoff bound uh, says that the probability of a single cut failing is about uh, <coughs> e to the minus mu, the expected value. And by our, our lower bound on mu above, uh, this is at most uh, four to the minus k, uh, n to the n to the minus four k. So now uh, now we just want to union bound over all cuts of this size. Uh, and since we were fixing the size of u to be k, the number of such cuts is n choose k. So the union bound says the probability of any, any cut failing is at most the sum over k, the product of this failure probability times the number of, of uh, cuts to union bound over. And by uh, some calculations, this is at most uh, 1 over n squared. So uh, assuming those bad events don't happen, then uh, we've preserved uh, every cut uh, to within a multiplicative factor. So if we boosted up the sparsified edges by this factor 1 over p, then we'd get a sparsifier. OK, so uh, that's uh, very straightforward. So the, the, the key uh, points uh, I want to make here is that there are three important ingredients to this argument. So first of all, we needed the Chernoff bound to analyze the, the deviation of a single cut. Then we wanted to bound the number of small cuts. And then we did this uh, union bound, which uh, uses this, uh, this idea of having an exponentially small failure probability uh, fighting against this exponentially increasing number of bad events uh, with a particular parameter k. And so then the arithmetic works out, and, and uh, uh, you get that no bad events happen. All right, so I want you to remember these three ingredients later, which is why I put a pink elephant up there, because pink elephants never forget. So, uh, so how do we generalize this argument to arbitrary graphs G? So uh, these ideas are due to Bankser and Karger. So consider this example, the sort of standard dumbbell example. So in this example, we want to eliminate most of the edges here because this part's very dense. But uh, we don't want to eliminate this edge here because it's crucial for connectivity between the two pieces. So what this suggests is that we can't sample all the edges in this graph with the same probability. We want to do some sort of uh, non-uniform sampling. So their idea was to sample these low connectivity edges with high probability and the high connectivity edges with low probability. So here is their, uh, their algorithm and this is sort of a general template for a sparsification algorithm. So the input is, uh, a, is a graph and some parameters on the edges. These uh, PE values are the sampling probabilities and the output is going to be this uh, weighted subgraph H. So all we simply do is we do <coughs> 
row rounds of sampling, and in each round we look at each edge and sample it with probability PE. If we sample it, we add it to the sparsifier and increase its weight by 1 over rho PE. So that now the, the technical question becomes, can we choose uh, rho, the number of rounds, and the sampling probabilities to obtain a sparsifier? So one thing to observe is that in expectation, everything is working out fine, right? So the, uh, for any particular edge, E, its expected weight in the sparsifier is 1 because we're sampling at rho times with probability PE, and if we sample it, we increase its weight by 1 over rho PE. So by linearity of expectation, we can look at any subset of edges, any cut, uh, and the expect expected uh, weight <coughs> of those edges is just equal to the size of the cut in the original graph. So in expectation, everything is fine. Now the difficulty is to uh, show that everything, all of these are close to their expectation. So if we can get concentration for the, the weight of a sampled cut, then we can uh, union bound over all cuts. What does PE mean? PE is a, a some sampling probability for an edge. So I haven't, uh, this is sort of a generic algorithm at this point. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so the Banks or Carter algorithm, the Spielman Servastov algorithm, our algorithm are all just instantiations of this. Uh, so now I'll tell you what they are. Uh, so in the Banks or Karger uh, work, they, they did log n, order log n rounds of sampling, and the sampling probabilities were 1 over the edge strength of an edge, uh, where I've written the definition of edge strength, but I don't expect you to read it. It's just some quantity uh, that, as far as I know, they came up with uh, for their paper, and uh, uh, it's in some sense similar to uh, edge connectivity. And they showed that this preserves all cuts. They also showed that if you uh, add all the sampling probabilities, so the sum of the inverse of the edge strengths is less than or equal to n, uh, which implies that in each round of sampling, in expectation, you take at most n edges. And so the total number of edges is order n log n. And the running time, so they gave an algorithm to estimate these edge strengths. And their total running time is order m log cubed n. Spielman and Srivastava uh, also use this generic framework, except they sample with probability uh, 1 over the effective conductance of an edge, where uh, effective conductance is some other notion that's uh, similar to edge connectivity, uh, but I won't get into the, um, the details. So essentially, this comes from uh, the theory of electrical networks. And they show that this... Uh, uh, this sort of sampling gives you a spectral sparsifier, and again, the number of edges is about uh, order n log n. There, but in order to compute these uh, effective conductances, they needed to use the Spielman-Teng uh, linear, <coughs> linear system solver, uh, which is rather, uh, well, in, in, the, the running time has a lot of log factors. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, so in the original work, it was large, and, and there have been some improvements. So uh, in Fox last year, Kudis, Miller, and Peng dropped the uh, number of log factors down to just three. Uh, so one uh, point I'd like to, to say about this is that uh, they, they use uh, what I'll call the, uh, a matrix turnoff bound, uh, which is... Uh, uh, so, so to show that the Laplacian matrix of the sparsifier approximates the Laplacian matrix of the original graph, uh, they, uh, that's where they need this matrix turnoff bound, which is rather more elaborate than the usual turnoff bound. So in our work, what we show is that uh, if you do order log squared n rounds of sampling, then we can choose our sampling probabilities to be uh, a somewhat more natural quantity. The, uh, so simply one over the edge connectivity of an edge. So the, the minimum size of a cut that contains uh, this edge E. And this was actually a question of Bankster and Karger uh, is as to whether this sampling approach works. And this was independently proven by uh, Hariharan and Panigrahi uh, at the same time. So uh, 
how does edge connectivity differ from these previous notions? Well, it's actually uh, at least the, uh, the strength and at least the effective conductance. So our, uh, that means our sampling probabilities, our PEs, are at most the sampling probabilities used in the previous work. So we're doing, uh, the sampling is more aggressive. Our, our sampling probabilities are even lower, so uh, we take fewer edges, in a sense. Uh, so it's, this is the, the most aggressive sampling regime. And uh, it also, so sampling, because we can sample with these probabilities, uh, it also implies that sampling with strength and effective conductance works as well. Uh, so as before, we, uh, the, the sum of the PE values is at most n. And so the number of edges we get is n log squared n. And our running time is uh, a little bit uh, less than the previous ones. Uh, largely because the edge connectivity values are, are, are quite simple to understand, and so we can uh, estimate them more efficiently. Yeah. It's, it's not really obvious that if the probability is dominant, uh, those with other sampling procedures, you would have... No, it's... I mean, it, you really need tight concentration. And it, it's not a direct implication, but it, it is true. So, yes. So the, the fact that we can uh, sample according to edge connectivities, if you just go through the calculations does imply that uh, those other methods work as well. Yeah. Uh, so the advantages of this are, are uh, using these easier uh, sampling probabilities uh, and, and also it implies that the, the previous results work. Uh, also one, one point I'd like to, to make here is that uh, it also implies that sampling according to random spanning trees works. Uh, and I'll talk more about this later. but. Uh, uh, the basic idea is that if you choose a uniformly random spanning tree in a graph, then the probability any particular edge is in the tree is equal to the effective resistance of that edge. Uh, and it's also known that the uh, the event of two edges uh, occurring in the events of two edges occurring in the tree are negatively correlated. And it's known that if you have negatively correlated events, then the turnoff bound still applies. So because our, uh, our whole analysis is just based on the standard turnoff bound, then uh, uh, because sampling by effective resistances works, sampling random spanning trees also works. So this uh, doesn't follow from the previous work, which used the matrix turnoff bound, because it's not known how negative correlation interacts with the matrix turnoff bound. Yes. And you can compute m s t cups implying m log square n. Ah, OK. So if you wanted to compute uh, all of these uh, s t min cuts, then uh, what you really want to do is compute a Gomery Hu tree. So a Gomery Hu tree encodes all the uh, pairwise minimum cut values. Uh, but the time to compute a Gomery Hu tree by the best known algorithms is uh, something like order m times n, uh, so too high. So uh, instead what we do is this estimation, uh, so we don't compute the exact uh, st min cuts, we, uh, we estimate the min cuts uh, using uh, these uh, Nagamochi Ibaraki uh, forest decompositions, uh, which are the, is the same method used by Bankser and Karger. So, uh, so Bankser and Karger wanted to estimate the edge strengths so they build on this, uh, this work of Nagamochi and Ibaraki, uh, and they need to make it a little bit more elaborate. Uh, so, so in a directed graph, you can approximate min cuts in uh, quaternion time. Yes, for, but not for uh, sort of in amortized. Uh, so it's not oh, that. Oh, I see. Some cuts must be wrong, very wrongly approximated, yes. but others. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So in fact, in order m time. So the algorithm is, is just a, a trivial uh, sort of greedy forest packing algorithm. Yeah. OK. Uh, so the, uh, the disadvantage of, of our work is that we have this uh, extra uh, log factor. So we do log squared n rounds of sampling, and we don't prove uh, spectral sparsification. 
But uh, here's a, a simple trick. We can decrease our number of edges from n log squared n to n log n by simply running the Benxer Carger algorithm on the output of our algorithm, uh, which uh, seems like it's not fair, but actually uh, it is fair because uh, then their algorithm is running on already a very sparse graph, so their algorithm gets faster. Uh -huh. Okay, so, so with that trick, uh, the running time is m log squared n plus o tilde of n. <coughs> okay. And uh, uh, Panigrahi uh, was able to, to build on uh, this work. And, uh, well, as I said, they, they were doing it independently. Uh, and he showed that, in fact, you can find a, a sparsifier with n order, order n log n edges in strictly linear time in unweighted graphs. So order m time in unweighted graphs. This also uses like several algorithms, uh, like one after the other? Or uh, it's actually a bit different. So it, <coughs> it uses a sort of adaptive sampling method rather than uh, simply just picking edges uh, independently. So it's quite a bit more elaborate. Do you know which uh, physics advantages are necessary? Like ah. the algorithm fail if you set run e log n? Uh, I, I do not know that any of the disadvantages are necessary, uh, except uh, sampling by strength and or edge connectivity will definitely not give you a spectral sparsifier. But also, n log n edges are necessary by differential choice. But if you take a complete graph, then by symmetry, all those parameters will be the same on all edges, so they're just sampling. Yes. Which will be disconnected if you don't have any log n. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, any, any more questions before we go on? Okay. Uh, so, so Luke, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that uh, towards the end. So, the uh, so let me sort of give an overview of the analysis idea. Uh, so, I'm going to let K, KUV denote. Uh, the edge connectivity of the edge uv, so the size of the min cut separating u and v. So the idea is to uh, partition the edges of the graph into connectivity classes. So we'll, we'll write the edge set E as E1 union E2 uh, and so on, where every edge in EI has edge connectivity value approximately 2 to the i. So for example, our graph might look like this, and here is uh, uh, E1 and E2 and so on. So uh, then the, the next step is to prove that the, the weight of the sampled edges uh, that each cut takes from each connectivity class uh, is about right. So the amount of error is not too large. So for any cut u, the size of our cut u intersects ei. Uh, <coughs> if we look at the, the weight in our sampled graph versus the weight in the original graph, the error should be at most the size of the cut divided by, say, 2 log n. And uh, so, in a, for, for example, we might take this cut u, and then uh, we're looking at the intersection of the cut u with these different connectivity classes. And so now, just uh, by the triangle inequality, uh, this shows that uh, you get a, a sparsifier. Right? So the, the total error uh, in the cut defined by u is at most the sum of the errors in each individual connectivity class and we've chosen our parameters so that that adds up to at most half of the, the cut value. So, uh, so why, why do we do this? So sort of the, the key point here is that if I look at any of the edges uh, in this cut intersected with EI, then they all have nearly the same weight in the sparsifier. Right, remember the the weight that the edge is given in the sparsifier is 1 over the sampling probability, and the sampling probability is 1 over the connectivity. So, so the weight is, exact, is uh, essentially the, uh, the connectivity of the edge. And if you, if you look at a, a turnoff bound, so the, the turnoff bound works best when all of the, uh, uh, the random variables that you're summing have uh, the same range. So normally when you see the turnoff bound stated, it says uh, all of the uh, sum ends in your random variable 
are in, say, between 0 and 1. And of course, if they were in a larger range, say, between 0 and uh, k, you could just scale it down so that they're all between 0 and 1. So that's fine. Uh, but if they all have you know, very differing, uh, wildly differing values, then the turnoff bound doesn't work very well. Uh, so the, the, that's the key point uh, here, is that we're sort of grouping edges <coughs> into uh, classes that have the, the same, uh, roughly the same range. So the turnoff bound will work better. OK. So uh, let me now define some notation. So suppose I have a cut C. I want to let C sub i denote this intersection of the cut C with the connectivity class, EI. And I'm going to call this a, a cut-induced set. So this single edge here is a cut-induced set. These four edges here are a cut-induced set, and so on. And what we'd like to prove is that the, the sampling error for any cut-induced set is at most uh, the size of the cut that induced it divided by log n. So that's our goal. And now I want you to recall the, the pink elephant. So the, the key ingredients that we needed were uh, the, uh, the turnoff bound to, to prove a concentration on the, the weight of the sample, and then a bound on the number of small cuts. Uh, but in this case, we're not talking about cuts. We're talking about cut-induced sets. So the bound is a little more uh, intricate. So what we'd really like to show is that the number of cut-induced sets induced by a small cut is small. And that's a little bit of a, a mouthful, uh, so it, I'll state it uh, formally soon. And then again, we'll just do a, a union bound over all uh, cut-induced sets uh, to show that no failures happen. OK, so here is the, uh, the formal statement of the, of the mouthful. So, uh, so suppose I have any graph G and fix any subset of the edges uh, B, the, say the blue edges, then, uh, and, so, and suppose that for every blue edge, uh, its connectivity is at least uh, capital K. So this lower bound on the connectivity of any edge, any blue edge. Then the statement is that uh, for any uh, factor alpha, the number of cut-induced sets, so, so here uh, cut-induced sets means uh, with respect to these blue edges, which you could think of as, say, being a connectivity class. So the number of cut-induced sets induced by a cut of size at most alpha k is at most n to the 2 alpha. OK, so uh, that's the, the formal statement. And again, it's a, it's a little bit uh, tricky to parse what it means. So let me illustrate it by comparison uh, to Karger's uh, results. So Karger in 93 uh, gave this useful, uh, useful fact about small cuts in an undirected graph. So he said, uh, if you have any un undirected graph with uh, global connectivity value k, then the number of small cuts, so the number of cuts uh, of size at most alpha times k, is at most n to the 2 alpha. Uh, so that's uh, well known. So that, for example, the number of min cuts is at most n squared. The number of cuts of size at most twice the min cut is at most n to the fourth, and so on. Uh, so, so our theorem is a, is a generalization of that. Uh, and the, this corollary is just the special case of every edge being blue. So if every edge is blue, then uh, the global min cut value is a lower bound on the connectivity of every edge. Uh, and if every edge is blue, then this uh, disappears. OK. So, uh, so I'd like to uh, compare these two uh, statements with a very unfair comparison. So I, I've substituted here, uh, I've replaced alpha with c over k, where c is just some arbitrary value. Uh, so here are the two statements, uh, just rewritten in that way. And let's look at an example graph. So consider this graph, which is just a, a matching on n vertices. How many cuts of size 1 are there in this graph? 
Uh, well, you know, these are just the singleton cuts around uh, any vertex, so there's, uh, uh, say, n or n over 2 or uh, something like that. So our theorem says there are at most n squared such cuts. We just let every edge be blue, and we let k be uh, the minimum size of, so it's for any blue edge, the minimum size of a cut separating its two endpoints. Uh, and so plugging that in, we get there's a most n squared such uh, cuts. But uh, Carger's cut counting result says that there doesn't give a useful bound. It says that there are most <coughs> infinitely many. And that's because the edge connectivity of the whole graph is zero. It's, it's disconnected. So that's kind of a, a bit sneaky because you're not supposed to apply Carger's bound to disconnected graphs, but it kind of illustrates the, the point that uh, Carger's bound is sort of not normalized correctly in that it sort of assumes, uh, assumes con uh, connectivity. Uh, so for example, I, I could make the whole graph connected by adding edges of value epsilon or something like that. And as you took the limit as epsilon goes to infinity, then his bound uh, goes off to, uh, as epsilon goes to zero, his bound goes off to infinity. Uh, uh, the bound. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it's independent of n. Yes. So, so everything held for weighted graphs? Yes, everything holds for weighted graphs. Yeah. Yeah. There any, any questions? Ah, okay. Yes. Uh, okay, good, good. So this is, let me flip to the next slide. Uh, so uh, the, the definition here is, is a little bit tricky. So we defined a, a cut-induced set to be a subset of edges. And there are many different cuts that can induce the same set. So what, what Ryan was, was noticing is that, you know, for example, if I fix this one blue edge, then there's you know, roughly 2 to the n uh, cuts that separate only that edge, or 2 to the n over 2 or something like that, because I can arbitrarily choose each other blue edge to be uh, you know, on, on one side or the other side of, of the cut. So uh, yes, there, there can be many cuts inducing the same set. But if I just look at uh, <coughs> the, the edge set itself, then, uh, then there's a, at most uh, n squared of them. In fact, n over 2 of them. So that's sort of a, a subtlety in the, in the statement of the theorem. So really, the, the set in here uh, uh, we're sort of Im implicitly, in taking its cardinality, we're throwing away duplicates. Like it, we're definitely treating it as a set, not as a multi-set. So doesn't the fact that you take the boundary to the boundary in B to the smaller than C? Uh, so you're counting the... Oh, uh, here... The second vertex? This, so you're asking, should there be an intersect B there? No, so we, uh, we really need it to be uh, like this. Uh, so I would suspect it's not true. It should not be true if you put the intersect B there. Yeah. So if you look at the bound theorem, you just take the graph, you remove all the cuts of size K and F, and then apply in Carver's bound to each component? Uh, it's, uh, it's not quite that. It's not quite that. Uh, all right, so uh, I don't know how to... Uh, prove this from Carger's bound in a black box fashion. OK, any other questions? OK. Uh, so now let me tell you how we, how we do prove it. And uh, I am interested to know other proofs of, of the theorem. So if, if you do know another way of proving it, I'd be happy to, to hear about it. OK, so here's, uh, here's how Carger's proof works. So it, it's, it's based on his uh, randomized min-cut algorithm, which simply uh, uh, so repeatedly picks random edges, contracts them, and continues until uh, there are only two vertices left. And then it outputs the remaining edges. Uh, so what's known about this algorithm is that for any particular min-cut, it's output by the algorithm with probability at least 1 over n squared. And so consequently, there are at most n squared min cuts, because that, that holds for any min cut. Uh, 
so here is the uh, a variant of that algorithm that proves our theorem. So we, it's essentially the same, but we introduce this idea of, uh, of splitting off in the, in the algorithm. So, uh, so during the algorithm, we look to see if there's any vertex V which has no incident blue edges. And if such a vertex V exists, then we split off all edges at V and delete V. And uh, what we, uh, so let me tell you what splitting off is, uh, if you haven't seen it before. So the, uh, the idea is, if we have this uh, vertex V with uh, many incident edges, then uh, say it has edges from U and U prime, then there's a, there's a way of uh, deleting these edges UV and U prime V and replacing them uh, with uh, edges that do not involve V. So just say, a, in this case, a straight edge from U to U prime that preserves the pairwise edge connectivity between every two vertices other than V. Uh, so, so if V has uh, any number of, uh, of neighbors, then there's always a way of, uh, of moving these edges off of V uh, while preserving these edge connectivity values. So if you have a star, you're going to get a cleat, right? Uh, like uh, the center, you're know, moving, splitting off from the center of the star, you get a cleat on the No, no. Oh, no, a cycle. Ah, a cycle, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so two edges get merged into one edge. Oh, oh, you're asking? Can vertex ever cleat to have incident edges in B? Yes. Uh, so, okay, so Ryan's question was if I uh, can, so essentially I think you're asking, can I just do the splitting off at the beginning of the algorithm? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, so, so the answer is no. Uh, so, um, uh, so let me think of an example. Um, um, uh, okay, uh, let's, let's, uh, off the top of my head, let, uh, uh, well, just so, so, so if you contract the neighbor of a, of a blue, a neighboring point to a vertex that has an incident blue edge. Uh, contract the edge between the two. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes, okay, yeah. right. So for example, in this, uh, right, so in this matching case. So for example, I, I could have contracted this edge, yeah. and then I'm left with a, a vertex split with, it off a little, off right. Yeah. But, but in this case, splitting it off is trivial because it has no edges anyways, yeah. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so that's a, a result of MADR. Uh, I'm being a bit uh, informal here. So there are some technical conditions you need. For example, uh, so the degree of V uh, is supposed to be uh, even. Uh, but in, 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 right, because otherwise it would not be possible to split off all edges at V. But uh, for our purposes, that's, uh, that's irrelevant because uh, I could have just started I can just take my graph and uh, double each edge, and then the, the splitting off applies. So sort of all, all of our statements are invariant under scaling the original graph G, so I'm happy to just double the number of edges. Sort of doesn't matter here. OK. So by uh, a similar argument, of, uh, uh, similar to Carger's argument, we can show that for any uh, minimum cut-induced set, this algorithm outputs it with probability at least 1 over n squared, and so consequently there's at most n squared minimum cut-induced sets. And similarly, if you introduce the, the factor alpha, it's still true. Okay. So that's sort of the, the main uh, cut-counting ingredient in our analysis. Yes. 
uh, I mean, you can just think of it as a multigraph. So, yeah. so if you have a if you have a weighted graph, just scale up the weight so that every edge is an integer, uh, and in fact, scale it up so that it's an even integer, and then just uh, view it as a multigraph and just apply ordinary splitting off. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, uh, all I have to say about our analysis. Let me just say a few words about uh, random spanning trees. So the, the theorem we get there is that if I take, uh, if I set rho to be log squared n, and I take rho uniformly random spanning trees of the graph, uh, then I create a sparsifier where each sampled edge E is weighted by one over rho times uh, at the effective resistance of E, then, uh, then, uh, then we get a sparsifier. So every <coughs> cut is preserved and the number of edges is n log squared n. So uh, why does this work? And this is, as I said before, the probability of any edge being in the spanning tree is just equal to its effective resistance. And that was uh, known to Kirchhoff in the 18, 1847. And uh, so in that sense, it, it's similar to the usual independent sampling algorithm where the sampling probabilities are just set to uh, the effective resistance values. But the, the difference is that the sampling now is dependent, not independent. Uh, but the occurrence of edges in the random tree is our uh, negatively, negatively correlated events. Uh, and so uh, Chernoff bounds are still known to uh, work in this scenario. So in the format of the paper on 1940? Ah, yes. Uh, so this is actually a paper of uh, uh, Brooks, Stone, Smith, and Tut. Uh, so when they were undergraduates at Cambridge University. So this is their paper on uh, squaring the square. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of this. Okay, we can. Okay, and so now to address uh, Luca's question earlier. Uh, so what, what Luca said earlier is that uh, if, you do that, if you do independent sampling, then you're doomed to, have, uh, to require at least n log n edges. Right, for example, if you started with uh, uh, a, a clique, or another example would be an n cycle. Right, so an n cycle has, uh, if I just look at the singleton cuts, then there are n over two disjoint singleton cuts, each of size two. And so if I just do a single round of sampling, then each cut has a constant probability of having no edges. And so if I want every one of those cuts to get at least one edge, then I need to do at least uh, order log n rounds of sampling just to get connectivity. So you're, you're doomed to this uh, n log n edges uh, with independent sampling. So with random trees, uh, it seemed, uh, seemed conceivable that uh, uh, you might get around this obstacle. So with, if you pick a random tree, then you're already connected after just picking one tree. So it seems conceivable that you know that that's the main hurdle. That once you've got connectivity, then uh, everything else should go smoothly. Uh, but it's actually um, it's not true. So we have a, an example uh, in our paper showing that actually you you uh, this particular algorithm would need at least log n trees uh, to get a sparsifier. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to explain the example to uh, to those of you uh, after the talk. No, no. So, so according to the distribution, distribution. Uh, for this particular algorithm of sampling independent uh, uniform random trees, uh, that particular algorithm would not work. Okay, so let me just uh, wrap up. Uh, so uh, I talked about uh, graph sparsifiers, which I think are very interesting, explained how they're useful for fast algorithms and uh, and even their existence is an interesting uh, combinatorial theorem. Uh, explained how sampling with edge connectivities gives a sparsifier with n log squared n edges in m log squared n time. Uh, and then I mentioned that uh, this can be improved in various ways. For example, Panigrahi's improvement of n log n edges in uh, strictly, uh, strictly linear time. 
in unweighted graphs, and this is the bound for weighted graphs. And uh, I also pointed out that sampling by effective resistance works, and because we just use Chernoff bounds, uh, that implies that sampling random trees also works. So some questions uh, that I have is, uh, are, so first of all, is the log squared factor really necessary? So is it true that, uh, for example, if I'm sampling by edge connectivities, do I get a sparse fire with just uh, n log n edges? I would suspect the answer is yes, but uh, uh, I don't know how to prove it. And in fact, uh, the, the, uh, the other group, Haruharan and Panigrahi, uh, independently got stuck at the same point as us. Uh, they also got uh, the log squared n bound, so it suggests there's some sort of uh, conceptual difficulty in getting beyond that bound. Uh, and uh, so here's another question that I was wondering about, which also seems uh, uh, tricky. Is it true that sampling little o of log n random, uh, uniformly random trees gives a sparsifier that approximates each cut to within a factor little o of log n? So for example, uh, squ does, do square root log n trees give you a square root log n approximation to every cut? Yes, so we have a trade-off that uh, if you pick uh, k trees, then uh, the best approximation that you will get is uh, log n over k, I think. Log uh, one over k. Question? No, 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 as a lower bound. Oh, as a lower bound. As a lower bound, yeah. Really? So if, if we get a, get a matching upper bound, that would answer my question. Um, and let me think about that. Uh, so uh, I can't remember. So uh, we thought about this for a while. Uh, um, yeah, I, I can't remember. I need, I need to recall the details. Oh, if you just choose one tree, then uh, the lower bound would be, say, n, for example, right? So if I, if I just took a complete graph oh. and picked one tree, then you know there's a single a cut in the that just takes a single edge of the tree. So but the k tree is the lower bound. Uh, for the, yeah. So for for one tree, one tree, you're definitely in trouble. For two trees, uh, it's not clear, right? So you. Uh -huh. okay, so then yes. you were able to say that each term was less than 1 over log n, provided that your expectation was at least log n squared. Yes. So yes. it seems that if you have a constant number of trees, you could bound the error by a constant for each term, so that you would have log n. Ah. Uh, um. I need I need to check. Uh, yeah, let's 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 let me uh, go through the calculations carefully in my head afterwards. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Bassin theorem should have some uh, uh, algorithm itself, but like online and union scanning trees. Ah, uh, so. <coughs> I guess uh, I mean a related question is whether maybe not necessarily sampling a small number of random scanning trees is good, but even existence of a small number of random trees. Yes, uh, 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 that's a good question. So uh, Amin Saberi claims that uh, the output of the batson spielmann Srivastava algorithm is, is not uh, a union of a, uh, a constant number of spanning trees. And I think uh, uh, he attributed it to Alexandra Kola. Uh, but uh, I haven't seen the proof, and uh, so I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, one would suspect that uh, 
I mean, the, the conditions for a graph being a union of, uh, of k spanning trees is a well-characterized condition. Uh, just comes from matroid intersection, basically. So uh, it should, intuitively, sparsifiers should, you, you, you simply require sort of sparsity uh, everywhere in the graph. Uh, and one would expect that sparsifiers should have sparsity everywhere. So uh, it would not surprise me if there do exist sparsifiers that are a union of a small number of trees. Uh, uh, one question, I thought uh, Luca was going to ask a different question. Uh, so, uh, so let me answer the question he didn't ask. What about uh, this? <laughs> 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 I don't know about that. Uh, but, uh, okay, so, so in, the, in the analysis, uh, like, uh, like Luca said, we, we split it up into a, a log n terms, and we want each term to be small. Uh, and uh, so we just look at the sort of the total error is just the sum of the individual errors. Uh, so uh, the question I thought he was going to ask is, uh, if you have a weighted graph, uh, don't you have uh, more, you know, your number of connectivity classes is now unbounded. Uh, well, not, on, I mean, it's, say, at most n squared instead of at most log n. And uh, wouldn't you have to worry about summing over too many error terms here? So that is uh, uh, a tricky part of the analysis that uh, 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 I was trying to sweep under the rug. Uh, and uh, it, it requires, uh, it requires uh, setting up your error terms a lot more carefully than I did in this talk. So th think of this just as the, the simplified version of the analysis for unweighted graphs. Okay. And, and if you don't have any more, I can generate some of my own questions. <laughs> <laughs>